Καλησπέρα. Πριν ξεκινήσω την ομιλία στα αγγλικά, θα ήθελα να πω δύο πράγματα πολύ γρήγορα στα ελληνικά. Καταρχή, μεγάλο χειροκρότημα για όλα τα παιδιά που έχουν ασχοληθεί εθελοντικά. Να γίνει σήμερα πραγματικότητα. Το πρώτο. Το, το δεύτερο που θέλω να σας πω είναι ότι είναι πάρα πολύ μεγάλη τιμή μου που παραβρίσκομαι εδώ σήμερα. Ε, για μένα δεν είναι μόνο μια ομιλία. Είμαι γεννημένος και μεγαλωμένος στο εξωτερικό Έλληνες γονείς και εμένα για σήμερα είναι κάτι πολύ σπουδαίο γιατί είμαι καλεσμένος από Ελλάδα, έτσι το βλέπω εγώ, ότι είμαι καλεσμένος από Ελλάδα να επισκεπτώ εδώ, να συμμετέχω σε κάτι πολύ θετικό. Και ελπίζω το μικρό το κομμάτι που θα συνεσφέρω εγώ να μην σας απογο... α, απογοητευτεί, και να μην απογοητευτείτε και ελπίζω να ξαναβρεθούμε κοντά μια άλλη ακόμη φορά. Okay. Λοιπόν, πάμε. When I was a kid and, I, um, and people used to ask me what I wanted to be when I grow up, I used to respond by saying that I want to be an inventor. I've always been curious about things, especially technology. Um, when I used to see a new technology, I used to come across a new technology, the following questions always used to run as a natural part of my thought process. How does this work? Why does this work? Do we really need it? How can it be improved? Uh, will it be a part of our future? When I was, when I was four, I'm um, sorry, um, I first saw a computer when I was 12 years old at a friend's place. For me, a computer has always been a magical piece of technology that captivated me. I, um, it was a Commodore 64 computer that I saw at a friend's place, and um, it really left an impression on me. And it was a year after this that our parents bought us a computer for the family, and a year after this, I was actually lucky enough to be going to a high school that was one of the first high schools in Australia to have a dedicated computer lab. So at this high school, I decided to take the computer studies subject, and I'm really glad that I did, because in the second class of this subject, my life changed forever. Now, our computer studies teacher showed us how to program a computer showed us um, how to write a simple computer program that printed out a line on the screen and made just a simple beeping sound. And while most of my friends in the class um, weren't that interested in what was going on, I was absolutely mesmerized. I thought, wow. I thought, if you can make a computer do this simple thing and you can program it and tell it what to do, imagine what you can do if you spent a lot more time programming it trying to make it more intelligent and more advanced. So without even realizing it, I was already thinking about you know, artificial intelligence. How do we make a computer do advanced things like a human? Like, can a computer think? Can a computer be very humanized? So for the major um, assignment for this class, I decided to make a computer program called Let's Talk that could actually pretend to have a conversation with a real human. And I actually got an A-plus for this assignment. I thought, yeah, that's pretty cool. Like, at 14 years old, I got my first A-plus, so I was really happy about that. Um, I could go home and tell my parents about that. But um, look, the most important thing I want to say here is that I was now sort of inspired. I really had, had a nice appreciation about what a computer was and, and sort of realized its potential as a powerful tool. So... Following on from high school, I was lucky enough to go and study computer science at Griffith University back in Australia. And um, it was here at university that I really got the opportunity to delve deep into computer science, specifically artificial intelligence, working on medical systems that help doctors diagnose cancer um, in patients and also handwriting recognition systems so the computer could read what you write and then automatically tell you what that is. And um, I was also very lucky, I, and I, I was very lucky that I also did a PhD, and I also spent time in Tokyo at the IBM Research Lab in Tokyo, Japan, working with world-class researchers on intelligent thinking machines. So, as you can see, I've spent a good portion of my life thinking about 
thinking machines. So, I'd like to ask you something, though. Do you think a computer can think? Do you think that a computer can have some sort of digital brain and perform tasks like a human? Well, take a second to think about it. Um, computers play a very important role in modern-day society, and I would almost go as far as saying that computers have become a natural part of modern-day society, modern-day life, I'd say. Have you ever stopped to think about how we currently interact with computers today? We usually click on a button or we press a key, and we have to learn the way in which an application works. Um, look, there's nothing wrong with this, but um, have you ever stopped to think that maybe the way we currently interact with computers is a bit unnatural? Especially when computers are almost a natural part of modern-day life? Is there a way to make computers and machines a lot more natural and humanized? Well, I'm here to tell you the good news. There definitely is a way to do that. Let me explain. One of the most natural things that we do is breathe. All of us who are alive are breathing as well. We also use our legs and we walk around and we use our eyes to see things. And the, um, most of us communicate, interact and connect with each other by talking. Talking is one of the most natural things that we humans do. So, if talking is really one of the most natural things we do, and if computers are almost a natural part of modern-day life, why don't we just talk to computers to interact with them? Why don't we let computers talk to us? Let them learn how to interact with us, as opposed for us to learn how to interact with them. So, in 2005, I had an idea an idea to bring computers and machines to life by giving them personality, intelligence, by giving them a human form, by giving them the ability to hold a conversation with somebody. Um, the core part of my idea was to develop a technology that made it easy for us to interact... Um, uh, so, I'm sorry, made it easy for us to create virtual humans. So, I'm talking about humans that come to life, like humans that have a face, humans that have got a digital brain, that have the ability to have a conversation, to answer our questions, to help us with our problems, and interact with us in a very natural way. So, after developing this technology, um, especially after seeing that the internet, in around 2005, it was really obvious that the internet had really changed the way in which we communicate as people, I thought it made perfect sense to me to e extend the internet to include virtual humans to extend the way in which we communicate um, with computers and with each other. So, created these virtual humans. Here's a, here's a picture of Sam. And what I'd also thought I would do is go to one of the biggest banks in the world and ask them if they'd like to use our technology to provide customer service. So, here we see a customer who's arrived at the bank's website. They've clicked to chat and they get the virtual person on the left-hand side, and they start asking questions and having a conversation with the virtual person in a very natural way. So they will ask questions as if they were talking to a human, but there are no humans in the background. This is very autonomous. It's just artificial intelligence rendering out a conversation and interacting with a human customer. So this is what it typically looks like for a customer service application. Next, we got a call from NASA. Can you believe... Who, who in this room has got a call from NASA? Come on, come on, yeah. No, so NASA, so I just thought that was really exciting. I thought, like, wow, like NASA's actually giving us a call. And they wanted to bring intelligence and personality to, like, to their Phoenix robot in the virtual world. So you come along, you ask a question, and you talk with the robot. The robot responds, answering the question, and you can interact with it in a very natural way, having a conversation. Next, there was Katerina. Being of Greek heritage, I thought I have to create the world's first Greek-speaking virtual human. So this is Katerina, very proud of her. And then there was Clive, who actually speaks English and Greek, and he helps with language Hello. learning. Hello, how are you today? 
So you can what actually, have you been doing? So if you don't know English, you can talk to him in Greek. He responds in English and gives you translations, and you can have a conversation. This is very much different from going to the Frodi studio and learning at the Frodi studio. You're talking to a virtual human. What have you been doing? Okay. So, and then there was a Mary. She's a virtual nurse, talks to a patient, helps with diagnosis, connects with them, and so forth. So, Mary connects patients Hello, with doctors. I'm a symptom advisor. My name is Mary. Before we begin, I need to ask you a few routine questions to assist you to check your symptoms. Is this you? So, she talks with you, you answer her questions. Are you the one with symptoms or is it someone else? Okay, so you get the idea. So, what's common between all the applications that I've just shared with you now is that it's a conversational humanized interaction. This is very different from, you know, clicking on a button or filling out a form um, and having a very traditional sort of interactive experience. This is a, a humanized, free-flowing, conversational experience that you're basically having with a computer to perform the task that you need to perform. So, what I actually want to show you now is a, um, a real-life demonstration of this. I'm just going to put this down. So, so this is a Samsung Android device. And I'm going, to, um, I'm going to load up. I'm going to load up. Her name is Cami. She's a personal assistant. They can have a conversation with me and help me with things. So she's just going to load up in just a second. So what she can do is show a lot of personality. She can help with um, problems that I have, answer my questions, and also take me through a process. Um, let me try. Looks like the internet here is a little bit slow. I'll just try restarting that again. And the idea here is that I can pull out my phone at any time and talk to Cami and, and um, have a conversation with her. So here we go. Hi, how are you? I am doing just great. It is wonderful to be here at TED with you. We're so lucky to be at Thessaloniki, aren't we? Uh, she knows she knows for power. Yeah. It's okay. We're just starting, so let's continue the conversation. I'm going to a Greek restaurant later tonight. Okay, that's great. So that's, she's showing personality. She's engaging with me, showing personality through conversation. So now let's just see how she goes when I ask her a couple of questions. Let's just pretend that tomorrow we're going to get on a plane and we're going to travel from Thessaloniki to Seattle on the west coast of America. And I want to know what the weather is like in Seattle, but I'm just going to ask her if it's raining. Now I'm going to ask her if I need an umbrella. Do I need an umbrella in Seattle tomorrow? Check the weather and it looks like you may need some wet weather gear for sure. There might be some rain coming up in Seattle. So I'm asking about an umbrella, but she knows she has to check the weather, look at the weather and get back to me with a response. Let's continue. What's a good Japanese restaurant there? Check out a place called Maniki Restaurant. It's located at 304 6th Avenue. I hear it's really good. Their sushi is meant to be out of this world. Nice. So she, pr so she tells about a Japanese restaurant, also gives the address and all, and all the information that I need. Now, let's just pretend we've got a bono careful, I've got a headache. Let's just pretend, okay? I have a headache. <laughs> oh. 
Oh, you poor thing. I hope it is not too bad. <sighs> you know, there is some DuPont back at the hotel. Ah, we've got some DuPont back at the hotel. Lucky, lucky. So she's helping me here. You can see she's engaging. She's suggesting solutions and that sort of thing. So, um, look, this is really good, but now I'm going to show you something that is, is even cooler than this. She can actually perform tasks on our behalf. L let's say you want her to ring somebody up and, and get a message or make a booking at a restaurant. She can do this sort of thing. So, let's just pretend we have a friend called Fred. Can everybody have imagine they've got an imaginary friend called Fred? And, and we want to know if Fred, what he thought about the game. So, I'm going to ask her this. I wonder what Fred thinks about the game. Let me take care of this for you. I'll get back to you with the response as soon as possible. Now what she's actually going to do is call Fred. I have got Fred's phone here. Let's pretend to be Fred. She's actually going to call him. <laughs> right. She's now calling Fred. Um, I accidentally closed, so... Um, okay, yeah, I accidentally closed the call, so I was actually meant to say... Um, hang on, let's try that. Um, I'm not going to get... I'm not going to be able to say that again. Anyway... We go on. Okay, I accidentally closed the call, but she was actually like meant to give me a call. I was meant to respond there about that I thought the game was fantastic, and then she replies here like with that. But anyway, I'll keep going because in the interest of time. So le let's just say, um, okay, thanks for your help. We'll talk later. I am doing just great. It is wonderful to be here at TED with you. Okay, so. Um, We'll just um, so, so, so you can see the conversation here is going well, and I can um, I can connect with Cami and I can have a conversation with her. So um, yeah, sorry about the little mishap with the, with the phone, but we'll keep we'll, we'll keep it going. So as you can see here, the um, the idea is that we can interact with devices in a very humanized way, have a good conversation, and and interact with them in a way that's um, that's really humanized. So what does the future hold? Imagine walking into your kitchen and talking with your toaster telling it how you want to toast, make your toast in the morning, or you walk into the living room and, you're, and your TV tells you that the, a game is coming up, or you get in your car and it, you're driving home and it's telling you you need to change the tires soon or something like that. Um, this is what the future may hold if we wanted to. We can talk to devices, interact in a very natural way, and that's what this technology is all about. Now, um, I want to leave you with a quote um, and just make a comment about creativity. This quote from Albert Einstein, the great man, is actually quite a simple but very powerful quote because I believe creativity is based on imagination. If you have ima imagination you can, uh, and you let your mind run free to explore things, to create things in your mind, you can really do great things. I really believe that. If you really believe, overcome your own self-doubt. We all have doubts as humans, as individuals. Can I do this? Do I have the confidence? If you just... Let your mind run free, believe in your dreams, believe that the improbable and the impossible is nothing and that you can really go on and do really good stuff. So if you have the courage to create, then creativity will give you the courage to realize really great things. And um, with that, I'd like to thank you very much and I've got to stop all there.